Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? Teague Moore knows what's going on. And if you're uh, at a loss right now and you're a parent who's just trying to get a kid in any level, NAIA, JUCO, NCAA Division One, Two, or Three, Teague Moore, the wrestling consultant, he's the go-to right now, former head coach at American and Clarion University. He's coached at Harvard, Oklahoma State. The guy's been around the block. He knows what's going on. He's a man, right? Biggest uh, biggest investment, biggest decision in your, in your, your child's life, so – you know, get some answers, get them before it's too late. Right. Big, uh, big one tonight with uh Campbell assistant coach. Are you a, wait? So what are you coach Mahalik? You are, are you the associate head coach or the head assistant? I'm, I'm the associate head coach at Campbell. So the associate head coach for the Campbell camels in Bowie's Creek, North Carolina. Yep. Did I get that right? Yep. Bowie's Creek. Bowie's Creek. Okay. So the camels are in the Southern conference coach Mahalik. This is year number two there. Yep, the start of start of year number two for for our staff. So, okay, so you're you came down from East Lansing, out of the Big Ten, and you mm-hmm. you went Big Ten to Big Ten, right? Is that what it was? Illinois, then yep. Michigan State, now down to uh, Bowie's Creek and Campbell with Coach Sentes. How many years were you and him ever even teammates at Central Michigan? We, we were not teammates. I was actually a grad assistant with him there. Uh, he was a true freshman, uh, and I was there for half a season because I had to finish student teaching. <laughs> so I was there for a year and a half with him as a graduate assistant. I was never teammates, though. First off, that guy was a true freshman All-American out of Florida. He was a killer. Yeah. Yes, he a was. Monster he still is. A monster 125. Scotty Sentis was out of Florida. <laughs> yeah. I, listen, I talk to these guys who go to Central Michigan, who go to Edinburgh, who go to Buffalo from Florida, and I was like, when did you visit this place? That's what I always want to know when I talk to those guys, right? <laughs> I'm always like, what were these guys yep. thinking? But, okay, so tonight's guest is assistant coach for Campbell Camels, uh, Win Mahalik. Coach Mahalik is a three-time All-American and NCAA finalist for the Central Michigan Chip was four-time MAC champ, three-time All-American. Did I get that right, Coach? Yeah, that's it. Uh, that uh, that's it. Oh, oh, oh! I know. I I heard you grinding your teeth earlier. Two-time state champ. What's the story <laughs> behind that? Why were you grinding your teeth about two-time state champ in the state of Michigan? Oh, I I got upset. I got caught in a cradle. Well, I don't like I don't like I don't like using the word caught. So I got hit with a cradle in the semis my, my junior year and didn't get pinned, but I, I fought back and ended up losing by a point. Um, but I'm bitter about it. You know, I, I lost that match and I actually, that guy was my first college match. No way. Who was it? <laughs> Man, I couldn't tell you. He wrestled at Grand Valley actually. Um, so a Grand Valley guy caught you in a cradle. Well, it was what, what the, do you remember the high school at least? Man. Uh, no. <laughs> well, first off, what division were you guys? There's four divisions in, in uh, Michigan, right? There's four. I what was I was Division three. Caro is Division three. So what is it's Caro High School? Caro High School. And is that what's the graduating class at Caro? What, what? How many kids did you graduate? I, with? Do you remember? I graduated with a lot. I want to say it was like 180. That's that was like big. That's big. That was that was that was like the biggest. I want to say their graduating classes now are, are right around 100, 110. So they've, they've shrunk a little bit, but I had a big class. I had a gigantic class. Okay, so my mother-in-law is from the Thumb of Michigan. She is from like an hour away from where you are. Is it Harbor, Harbor Beach? Is that it, right? That's one. Harbor, Harbor Beach, yeah. That's really little, though. Harbor, Be- Harbor Beach is tiny. Yeah. Tiny, itty-bitty. Yeah. Harbor like, Beach really little, small. little little lake town right yeah oh yeah itty bitty and then they lived out in the country they didn't even live like on the lake you know what i mean they, which everybody's real close yeah. to the lake but they're not like on the lake on the lake live there like a lot of the people because that's the that's the draw yeah. right when you get up on on lake huron you can get some pretty good uh 
Lake Huron front property on the thumb of Michigan and you're on a great mm -hmm. lake. So I think that's the draw there, right? Yeah. How yeah. far were you from? Were you Saginaw Bay or were you uh, Lake Huron? No, we're, we're closer to the bay. You're closer to the bay. We're okay. closer to the bay. Yeah. I was, I was thing. like, I, same water. Yeah. I mean, the base. Yeah. Same water. The bay's just really, really shallow. So it was always warm in the summer, so, really warm. Did you jet ski a lot? Did you boat a lot? Did you fish a lot? Or were you just, were you just locked in on sports? No, man, I did all of it. I did all of it. We had, we had a, a little jet boat and kind of like a cabin cruiser when I was growing up. Um, did some fishing and stuff like that. Had a little pond in our backyard. Did did fishing whenever we could. But um, you know, when it came down to it, sports sports was always always more important. So that was our that was our chill time. But we had baseball or hockey or wrestling or whatever whatever the season was. That's what we were doing. You did play football. I've heard football stories, but it, it substantiate these. How good were you at football? Were you a Division One football player? Um, I had several division one opportunities. Um, most of them were walk-ons because they, they wanted me to play defense. I was a quarterback in high school. I didn't play a ton of defense in high school. Um, but I wasn't afraid to hit. I was fast, I was pretty, pretty darn fast. And I was big. So a lot of them wanted me to come and, and walk on and play defense. Um, just because they hadn't seen me, seen any film on me. Right. So that was, that was a bit of the downfall. Um, I was a uh, two-time All-State quarterback at Cairo. So what was your best I, season? I think I was pretty good. My, my senior year in 2002, we made the state, was it semifinals? And uh, we had a team that was really hot. They had some tragedy with their team, and they came out with an adrenaline rush playing for their, their lost teammates uh, in a car crash. And um, they kicked their butts. They beat us like 42-21, went on the next week and won like 42 to 14 or something like that. So they were um, Grand Rapids Christian that year in 2002. They, they really put it on. Um, but, yeah, that was our best season. Uh, we made the playoffs, had a little bit of a run, almost upset. Um, Chesseting High School, who ended up being state champs my junior year. But uh, they were definitely the better team that year. So. What was your best – give me, like, if you can statistically – I know you probably don't remember this, but did you ever throw 20 touchdowns? Did you rush for a lot? What, did, what was your – were you – you were a double, dual threat guy because you were fast. You had to have been. Yeah. What, what yeah. did you do? Like, what, give me your best statistical season. You are semifinalist as a senior. What was Win Mahalik's best year at quarterback? Um, my senior year, I don't remember the number of touchdowns, but we had – I rushed for 1,400 and threw for 2,200. <laughs> you threw for four you were a four thousand yard guy yourself close shy close, yeah. shy of four thousand yards oh my god you rushed for 1400 yards that's yeah, unreal yeah, we dude. ran like, like a spread option so it was fun did you have did you outrush all your running backs yeah but my my running back um he ended up playing division two ball at saginaw valley but he had I don't know what he had his senior year, but his junior well, – maybe that was his sophomore year. He was a sophomore, I think, my senior year. And he had, like, 1,200. Oh so, we were, we were a pretty good dual threat in the backfield. Here's what I gather from you. The reason that you don't know any of the stuff is because you probably never talk about this. <laughs> you no, never talk about this. You probably – none of your – your never. guys are going to watch this and you're going to be like, Coach Mahalik threw for 2,200 yards. He rushed for 14. <laughs> they're, they're gonna, it's going to blow their minds because you just won't say anything about it. And that's like, that's yeah. listen, that's the only thing about you. Like, you're just, you're not a guy who you just, you're a quiet guy. You're a nice guy. You're a humble guy. And that's what I like about it because you don't even know how many touchdowns you had. That's the best because you probably yeah, had no idea. 30 or 40 touchdowns would be my guess. Yeah, I don't know. Right I, honestly, it, no, I, I couldn't even guess to me. I have no idea. I love No it. idea. Bet you 40 touchdowns. I bet you. That's crazy. What was the best a football offer for you? Like Michigan State wanted you to walk on? And it, Western Michigan? Yeah. Um, Central, Western, Michigan State, Northwestern, um, Purdue, I think Indiana. All, all walk-on offers. And then I had some D2 um, scholarship offers. 
uh, Michigan Tech, Saginaw Valley, Northwood. Um, but I actually really was close to committing to Michigan Tech, and they had an issue where they were, like, talking about dropping their program, and I just decided I wasn't going to deal with it and decide to wrestle. <laughs> Do you regret that at all? Like, honest question. You could have gone, been a big time. You probably could have been an NFL football player eventually. I understand that that's not your goal, right? But you probably could have gone and been competitive, been one of these stories we're talking about, right? Like one of these guys who could have made it happen. Do you regret I would it? like. I would like to think so. Um, no. I mean, I've always been kind of the person, like, make a decision – live with it, go hundred percent, don't look back. And, uh, that's what I did with that decision. You know, even after I all American as a freshman at central, they came and asked me to come and like come out for spring ball and, and kind of like see if I would have been a fit for something on their team. Cause they just, they had recruited me. They knew I was an athlete and they saw how competitive I was. And, um, I just told them no. <laughs> so what Borelli I just said. didn't look back. I didn't want it. What Borelli said. Um, I did have that. If you want to. I had that. No, no. That was, we had the conversation and he kind of said like, well, I mean, if that's what you want to do, but I mean, you were an All-American and you told me your goal is to be national champ. So do you think you can do that? Do you think you can be a national champ in wrestling and compete in football? And, you know, my answer was no, I, I didn't. I didn't think that. I could split my time like that and, and still put the hundred percent focus into wrestling and be a national champ. I mean, you made the right choice. Ultimately, if that was your goal, I mean, you, there's not even like, it's not really up for debate at that. You know what I mean? Like a guy like that knows too. Yeah. a guy like that's so dialed in on his, cause he knows his athletes so well. That's what's really amazing about him. That's what I respect about him. I love being able to see him about once, you know, once a year, talk to him every other year in an interview and just watching him, how he, interacts with people tom borelli is just a class act and he's there they're just human iq of knowing people is through the roof him and his son man it's actually pretty incredible to, yeah to, to talk to those guys and listen to them and see how they like figure people out it's 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 really incredible and how they they live like that too right they live really yeah they live like that they live their lives like that for their passion right they love wrestling and they live for their athletes it's pretty incredible i'm impressed with him and obviously that's why you ended up there so what yeah. were the other places yeah. what big 10 schools came after you as far as wrestling because you know you're a two-time state champ we well, you, you were third your junior year yeah yeah what did you get as a freshman um i didn't place uh i went oh and two yeah i went oh and two lost to man my first one, I lost a really close match, but I also um, had strep. So I wrestled, but it wasn't, it wasn't my best performance. So. so were you like a 60 pounder as a freshman? What weight were you as a freshman? 52? How, were you big? Uh, 52. That's 52. tough, man. That's tough because that's all juniors and seniors yeah. at that weight. You were probably the only freshman in the weight. Yes, I was. I was. That's so crazy. So your senior year was 03? Or, yeah, 03. Yep. So okay. you're the same age as Kish and J.D. Bergman, right? Yep, yep. And those guys were parentally at your weight. They were either uh, – Kish was 84, then yep. he went up to 97. J.D. was 97 and went up to heavyweight. Because J.D. Bergman's from the same high school as me. But the reason I bring yep. up Kish, because Kish was it. He was the Patty Gallagher. Yep. He was the – He was uh, it. He was it. He was the Spencer Lee. He was the, the best guy pound for pound in the country. What was that like Yes, kind of coming up tit for tat with like Roger Kish and probably always being compared to him? Um, honestly, like it was, it was funny. So like in Michigan, we had the MMWA and like, honestly, Kish is from like 40 minutes away from where I grew up, you know, in Lapeer. And so I knew who he was from like a real young age, but that dude was so built. I mean, he was, he was jacked. He was 12 years old. And I thought he was like a junior or senior in high school. He was, he was, he was just that guy you looked at when you were a kid and went, wow. But, um, I did get a chance to wrestle him as a junior and I lost five to three. And I actually put that in my recruiting videos when I sent him to colleges my senior year, just because I thought I wrestled really good. I just didn't have 
that wrestling knowledge and that experience of wrestling close matches like he did. And he was so good. I mean, he was, he was so good, came out, chopped me, picked me, took me down right out the whistle. Um, so I always looked up to, to Roger as like just that guy that I wanted to reach his level in high school because he was it, man. He was, you know, other guys coming up. He was, you know, a Brett Metcalf, a, a John Reader. He was to me in my age, that's who I was looking to be like. And, um, you know, to see him have his college career like he did at Minnesota, you know, we still talk, you know, when I see him out recruiting and stuff like that, you know, we still talk like I'd go and practice with them sometimes um, because they were division two and we we're division three. So going and practicing with them before the state tournament wasn't a big deal. You know, we'd go and work out and man, honestly, I was probably a little intimidated. <laughs> it's pretty incredible what some of those Michigan high schools have done. Obviously. Uh, so is Mitch Hancock would have been one of your teammates, right? He'd have been older. He, he the, was. Yeah, he would have been one of the he older was, guys. Yep. He was, he was a senior my freshman year. We all American together. So that was, that was pretty special. Yeah. So what he's done is incredible. And you and I talked about it at the at Delta Combine. You guys have a horrible rule, like an awful rule that really hurts Michigan kids as far as their national rankings, which is good for you as a coach recruiting because then you're like – well, I already know who's who, and I know who's on the radar, who's not. So it's good for you, right? Like, you just look. Dundee. Dundee's D4. Dundee just had mm -hmm. two guys win the who's number one. Dundee, yeah. and Dundee has two of the top 14 high school wrestlers in the country, right? And yeah. that's not far from where I'm from because we grew up wrestling like uh, Temperance Bedford. That was yeah. awesome. We dueled them when I was a senior. Uh, my brother's always dueled against them. I think my brother Ferd used to wrestle like Kevin Vogel. Yeah. So it's like crazy. So we, you know, I'm from the Michigan line, right? The Toledo area. So I, I know the, I knew always knew the Michigan schools, but they had this horrendous rule, right? And it, it's still a rule they have. I can't believe it. It's yes. Did you do senior nationals and all that stuff? I did. I did. Um, I stopped playing baseball before my senior year or junior year. Um, so I wasn't, I didn't have a spring sport. So I went to senior nationals in Cleveland and competed. I think I lost in the round of 16 or something like that. But um, yeah, I lost my eligibility down there, you know, because they used our state tournament as a qualifier and it was an all-star tournament that they, they considered to be illegal by Michigan state high school standards. Absurd. Rid like completely ridiculous limits the kids and it's not even preserving like the amateurism and, and the, the no. it's not like protecting no. them from anything. It's, it's actually, it's detrimental. Yes. And it, I know you're very detrimental. Feel, yeah. And I know you feel that way. Cause I just like, I, when it blows my mind, cause I've talked to, I talked to Mitch about this. I talked to the Swiderski kid about it. Everybody I come across, I, I'm like, what is this rule? And they're like, yeah, they don't get it either. Cause I think now uh, DCC and Dundee both go to Brexville. I'm pretty sure they go to Brexville. So now Brexville yes. has to adjust the teams that they can have in, right? They can't have a yes. PA team and they can't have a West Virginia team and can't have a Kentucky team. And obviously the PA is the big one, right? And New York right. had a similar rule and then they got rid of it, I think four or five years ago, but it's like, it's just weird, man. It's a bizarre deal. I don't get it. It's detrimental to you. Okay. So baseball, you played baseball too. I love it. You did them all. You did everything. How are you? Right. How are you at baseball? I, I was, I was average. Honestly, I was average. Uh, our high school team was, I don't know, middle of the road, average, maybe a little above average some, but um, I, after my, after my sophomore year, I played summer ball and stuff like that. Got into my junior year of football and wrestling and just, I was done. I didn't, I wanted to concentrate on those two because those, I loved wrestling and I wanted to play football in college. So I just, I was done. It was, it was a distraction to me. It was getting me out of the weight room. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't worth the time, right? Before I'd done it, cause it was fun. Um, I liked playing. I still, I still, I play slow pitch softball today. I have a game tomorrow. <laughs> so like, I like it. I enjoyed it. But to me, it was, it was a distraction to what my goals were. So you're done with baseball. You're concentrating all on football. Did you go to Fargo? Because Fargo is during like football times. You probably didn't go to Fargo, did you? No, no, I didn't. 
I didn't wrestle a freestyle tournament until I think my third year of college. Wow. Not a freestyle tournament. I trained, I trained a little bit. I kind of like tweaked a couple muscles here and there. And then I never got into a freestyle tournament. And that would have been like either, either universities at the time, U23 now, or um, the open. Cause I didn't qualify for juniors anymore. So yeah, I, uh, I, I had a late start in freestyle for sure. Then you end up doing two quads. You did two quads, 08. Well, hold on. 08, you were a senior. So you probably from off, did you go right off of the NCAA finals, right into the, uh, right into the trials? Could you do that then? No, only the fine, only the champ qualified at that time. That was the only, okay. All right. And I, I mean, I, they always they changed the rules. So you didn't even qualify for I was, the Olympic. Yeah. I was going to, if I won it, I didn't. So I didn't qualify. Um, and then, yeah, that was, that was it. Uh, 2000, I, I graduated in the December, technically in December of 2008. And then I was a GA at Central for the next two years, right? So 2009 and 2010, I trained, started to get my master's uh, and really trained. And Borelli knew that I enjoyed training. And um, basically after that, after my GA position time was up, I, he encouraged me to continue training and talk to, I talked to Brandon Slay and I ended up moving to the training center for two years. So were you with Casey? Was Casey the assistant and you were the GA when you were at Central as a coach? No, no. So Casey's last year at CMU before he went to Iowa State was my senior season. So your senior season, he did not coach you? No, he did. He, he did. did. That was his last senior. year there. Okay. And then he went to Iowa State yep. with Kale, and then he's followed him everywhere ever since. He's, yep. Okay. Yep. Casey Cunningham's a good dude. Like a real good dude. Yeah. Like a super nice guy. Yeah. That's the best thing. I keep bringing your name up to people. G great dude. Great dude. Everybody loves you. I've never, not, not a single person <laughs> said a crossword about Win Mahalik. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to have Win Mahalik on the show. Oh, I appreciate that. And they're like, oh, great guy. I'm like, what? He's the nicest guy ever. I talked to this guy, you know, at Delta. We hung up for a while. We talked. I'm like, wow, what a nice guy. And then Coach, uh, Coach Senta is really, I mean, obviously he thinks the world of you <laughs> or he wouldn't have hired you. But, um, he, you know, he has tons of, of great things to say, you know, tons of great things mm -hmm. to say about you. And, and that's awesome. And like across the board, man, haven't heard boo. I have only heard, yeah, <laughs> this dude's the man. I love that. That's a great thing, man. That's like, it's a huge compliment to you. And, and hey, I'm gonna be honest with you. Some of them are the enemies. Some of them are in Boone. Some of them are in Boone yeah. are saying good things about you. I like that. I really well, like. That's... So, um, okay. So, talk to me about the the your quad process. So we call it for people who don't know, the, a quad is a four year. So this year's a jacked up one. This year was a five. <laughs> this year was a penalty. yeah, right. Yeah. But we have quads. We have four year cycles, and we are trying to get guys to stick around for as many four year cycles as we can to get on Olympic teams and create and build depth. And that was kind of our problem going into 2000, you know, what led to 2010 with no medals. And then 2011, we got Jordan Burroughs and you were a part of, you know, two quads with Jordan Burroughs. Right. And you saw the, yeah. the face of USA wrestling change. You saw the attitude change. You saw the training situation change. You were a part of the RTCs, you know, coming to, coming to mm -hmm. uh, as a college athletes, the RTCs were being built when you were just getting in college. So you've seen all this win. You've been on the ground level of it. So you understand what RTCs are and how important it is to have senior level athletes training at your program. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's been an interesting, you know, going from 2008 where, you know, RTCs didn't exist right and and moving in through the programs and seeing rtcs develop you know through you know the performance method they've been they've been great for usa wrestling um i think they've been great for the university level keeping um keeping senior level athletes around keeping alumni around especially um but they're hard to run they're they're hard to keep up they're they're an extra part of, you know, a coach's job for most programs. And um, they're, they're worth it though. You know, in the long run, when you see USA wrestling and what the RTC model 
has done uh, keeping guys in the sport. It's been huge for our Olympians, for our world medalists, um, just just all around. It, it, it really is, I think, one of the main reasons that we have improved and we have that depth and we have so many of the elite college wrestlers continuing to compete on the freestyle circuit. So the big one for me is two guys that were trained with you. Um, Perez, right? Quentin Perez. He is up in Maryland now, right? With yeah. the, Army, yep. the, the, the Navy uh, Marines, RTC. And then I believe Dean Heil was with yep. you guys for a second too, right? Yeah, both of them, both of them were at Campbell before I got here. Um, and so like – we had we had an RTC ish here um, before I got here, but with with Kerry moving on, he kind of took those guys because he they he he helped them a lot. You know, he he did a great job developing developing um, Quentin from where he was. You know, I, I'm pretty sure Quentin had like a two and something record one of his first years at Campbell, and now he's you know an NWCA All American his senior year. 2020 when they didn't get to wrestle it out um and i think quentin's looked really good up there and the navy rtc so it 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 was good them following carry up there but that just means it's a rebuilding process for here at campbell trying to get our rtc up and running getting the support back going and getting guys that want to train you know last year we had andrew morgan that was sticking around was kind of like an rtc athlete for us um just because he was rejected on his appeal for an, for his last year. So um, it was nice having him around, but he also had had to move on because we're just, we're, we're getting there. Right. But when he needed a decision we didn't have that decision for him to stick around and, you know, moving forward from here, you know, we have, we have the ground blocks set. We have the RTC, we have the nonprofit, we have everything set up now to where we can start building that RTC for Campbell. And, you know, that's a big part of it. Like you said, you came up through the RTC model type program. It was non-existent when you got there at Central and then through your mm-hmm. college career and just watching it develop through the quads that you did as an athlete. I mean, it gives huge advantages to obviously Penn State, Ohio State, Nebraska can get a guy like Tervell, put him on the RTC staff until something opens up on the regular staff. I mean, it's not just – it's literally not just – the guys you're getting, but that you can go get better coaches. You can go get high level coaches. You can go get people that, you know, are, are going to draw kids, right? Hawkeye wrestling club yep. obviously has an advantage. Cliff Keen in Ann Arbor. It really, you know, it hamstrings and it, and it puts you guys at a bit of a disadvantage. Campbell it puts the SoCon schools that, you know, can't go get that don't have $7 million in the bank for their RTC to go get, a whole roster of Olympic athletes, right? It kind of puts you guys at a disadvantage. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a big part of – that's just a part of college wrestling, man, the haves and the have-nots. It's it's such a crazy Mount Everest playing field to sea level playing field of where people are. It's, it's, it's a daunting task for guys like you to do that. But uh, tell me about your experience training. Tell, tell me about what you did after Central – where did you go? What was the training situation like for Win Mahalik? Um, I moved to Colorado after uh, being a GA at Central. Moved out there for two years. Got to train with Coach Slay. Um, you know, it was it was big for me because, like I said, I was a noob, right? I was I was totally new when it came to freestyle wrestling. My mat strategy was terrible. Um, I was just athletic. I liked to go upper body, so it shocked some guys and. Um, you know, I had a decent, you know, experience freestyle wise, my junior and senior season uh, at Central, but then it was time for me to really buckle down. I had to get away from the folk style strategy, right? I had to, you know, start looking out. They were adding push outs and it was best two out of three. And I had to get fully immersed in that freestyle mindset. And, and it really did help at, uh, in Colorado Springs, getting to train all the time. You know, that was my job. They, they supported me very well as a, um, an OTC athlete. And, um, you know, they had great training partners when I was there. Dusk and Kilgore came out. Um, I lived with Marty Usman for the first year I was there. 
So, you know, I, I got to be around a lot of great guys and the other sports that are there, they have the same elite standards, right? So you're not just around other wrestlers that have the same goals, but you know, the Olympic mindset is, is different. You're in a college environment and, you know, baseball players, football players, basketball players, they want to go pro when you're at the Olympic training center, none of those sports go pro. They are looking for Olympic medals. So being around that like mindset and that training environment was really good for me for a couple of years into 2012. Um, but then after those two years, you know, some people left the train, some of the training partners left and I just felt like it was, there was, there was a need for a change of scenery and maybe a little, little bit of a mindset change. You know, I'd matured in the freestyle, you know, match strategy and training environment but um, I needed a little bit more mental experience when it came to tough matches, you know, senior level, you're wrestling NCAA champs every other match. Right. So you got to really be able to compete at that level hundred percent of the time. And I felt like moving to Illinois with Mark Perry um, starting as a volunteer assistant. Um, Cause I knew I wanted to be a coach in the future um, was a really good, good place for me to be. So I was there for four years trained through 2016, won the U.S. Open in 2015. Um, you know, had, had a couple line? of big wins. Is that your only stop yeah. sign? Yeah, it's the only one. <laughs> your only stop only sign. One. I'm just going to put it out yeah. there. You're probably in the minority there. <laughs> a lot of guys win all these other age group championships, and then they never win the U.S. Open, right? Like, it's really hard to win. Yeah. Because I think yes. J.D. Bergman and I just did a uh, – podcast and i think you beat him at the 2016 olympic trials i think is what he said is that right oh i don't remember i beat jd and i went back and forth a lot <laughs> yeah he beat me and then i beat him it was, yeah, it was what a, he said. literally like every other match <laughs> yes that's what he said and then you guys were both runner up as seniors because you were runner up at 97 yeah. he was runner up at heavyweight that year yep oh man this is the, we're, dude. We're digging. We're digging in the vault a little bit. And, and when when doesn't yeah. keep track on his uh track. He doesn't keep tabs on his career, so it's hard to to know who did what. I love it. <laughs> I could make stuff up, and you'd be like, "Yeah, it sounds right." I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> uh, okay, so you're at Illinois with Mark Perry. How did you do? Okay, do you at least know where you finished in Iowa City in 2016 at the Olympic Trials? No, I know I didn't make the team. That's all you care about. You didn't Actually, make no, I do. I do. I went 0 and 2. You went 2 and Skidoo? Yeah. I, uh, Are you sure? Because I think, I I think was, JD uh, said you beat him. Uh, not, not, not at the Olympic trials. Not at the Olympic think. trials? Um, you beat him somewhere. No. Because, yeah, I had – I think I might have beat him at a world team trials one That's year. That's what it was. World team trials. Um, and and I, beat him at, I beat, beat him at – I beat him at – Yes. Yeah. 13, yeah. I think it was. Um, 13. Yeah, I think it was 13. Yeah, 13 but, or 14. No, 2016, I went 0 2. I lost to Kilgore, actually, in the first round. Had a crazy match, like 11 10 or some, some really high scoring. It was always, I think we had a 35 point match one time when we wrestled. It was always high scoring between us. Well, um, you guys both wrestle really crazy and like wide open yeah. style. Right. Wow. He goes 100 miles an hour and I throw people. So, it, it was it was high scoring, but after I lost that and I knew I couldn't make the team, I uh, I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna back out. I wasn't gonna stop wrestling, um, like a lot of people do. You know, when they're when they're done, they just stop. I I didn't want to do that. I went out there and wrestled someone else. I don't I don't remember who it was. I just remember I remember getting in on a single leg, and him like sprawling on me and me falling backwards. I just. The adrenaline that you have for matches wasn't there because I couldn't get back up after that loss. So it, it was – I probably shouldn't have wrestled, honestly, but I did. I, I wasn't going to quit. I mean, that's the honorable thing to do. That's what we should do. We should all – you know, we should that's what not, we should do. We shouldn't dip. Agree. We shouldn't be like, later, it's over. You know, yeah. I, I, I like that. I like what you did. Whether you won or lost, I like what you did. You can tell your kids that, man. That's like you, you model. Yeah. That's good. That's called modeling. Modeling good behavior. But, okay, so you get through 16, you're in Illinois. Mm -hmm. When does the opportunity arise to go to East Lansing to Michigan State? Um, I actually, man, I want to say 
that Hef kind of had talked with Coach Chandler um, right around Big Ten time. So in March, he had they had talked about it, and Hef kind of mentioned something. Um, and then Roger talked to me in April. I know, I know it was April because he talked to me right before my honeymoon. I got married in January, went on my honeymoon after the Olympic trials. Um, and he talked to me right before I went and um, said, hey, when, when you get back, we'd love to have you up, have an interview. We did that. Um, I had a couple other interviews that I went on and ended up going to Michigan State. It was nice because it was back towards my family, back home, still in the Big Ten. And it was a full-time, big-time, big, big boy job. So it was, it was that time to get out of the, the competing and the training and, and start, start looking at building a family and, and a career. How's your body? <laughs> I don't think any, any wrestler above 35 could say their body's great, but um, I still get on the mat. You know, I get on the mat a couple times a week. Uh, I'm running a lot of practices, so I might not be on the mat during the practices quite as much, but I do jump on the mat with, with all of our big guys at some point, usually in the week. So. So they're still getting a lot of wind Mahalik beat downs is my guess. Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes you got to turn this, you can still turn the switch on. I got a feeling. Yeah, I can. I, I still turn it on and give it to them when, when they need it. Are the throws still there, or have you have you shelved the throws? And do you do front headlocks, run, run, go behind, ride the guy hard, get him tired, or are you are you using old kitchen sink when Mahalik stuff? Um, I would say a little bit of everything. You know, sometimes those guys need need the the basic hand fight and just give that stuff. But I'll go upper body. My guys have learned you don't want to you don't want to come upper body with me too often. So. Um, they kind of stay away from it, but I try and get them up there as much as possible because I think it's a really good weapon for them to have. Um, and I don't want them to shy away from it if they do have it. So um, I, I still encourage it. Um, but they know if we're, if we're going live, I'm probably going to win it up there. So I love it. I'd run. I'd be like, Nope, no, thanks. No, thanks. Just have a takedown. At that point, you can just snap guys down and just run around when they're so afraid to yeah. get thrown. It's crazy. Yeah. But okay. So from, did first off, did Willie Miklas replace you at Michigan State? Yeah, yeah, he came in after me after uh, you know the whole whole process of me leaving Michigan State, heading to Campbell. Willie came in as as my replacement, which is is pretty funny because Willie lived with me in his gap year at the training center. So that was Willie and I had a little bit of a relationship prior to him going to Michigan State too. So the the next thing, Willie Miklas is the same type of. Whenever you bring his name up to someone or ask someone about <laughs> yeah. him, same awesome thing. Same, awesome he guy. gets the wind maholic treatment. Oh, great guy, <laughs> best guy ever. That's like, I love that. I love that about Willie Miklas and uh, the stalemates guy who come came and covered your guys. Uh, uh, Zach Zach Bogle. Yeah, Zach. Zach got put into a pretty bad bind this year by a guy who keeps missing out on cards and and uh, stiffing people in the wrestling community. So. Willie Miklas stepped in the day of or the night before to save the card for Stan yeah. last summer. That's the type of guy he is. And he, he yes. had Russell guy yes. Gatson, right? I mean, unbelievable, man. So that it tells you the type of guy he is. I, don't, I think he was trying to be like, yeah, I don't even want any money. <laughs> that Just that type of guy, man. That That's like only fitting that that guy replaced you at Michigan State. So, okay. That's, that's funny because – that was, uh, I think, one of the stalemates cards. They were asking for someone upper, you know, somebody above 220. I'm like, well, who you – like, I, I messaged them and I said, well, who are you guys wrestling? They're like, I, I think it was Eric Thompson needs, a, needs, needs somebody to wrestle. And I'm like, no, that dude's too big. <laughs> golden Bear, dude? I wouldn't be messing with the Golden Bear, dude. Of course. <laughs> Eric Thompson's a monster, dude. And you know what yes. he does? Like, yes. He does like uh, – Obviously, he used to do all the Nittany Line Wrestling Club workouts in the M2. He worked for, for David Taylor at M2. And then yeah. the dude was a big – he's a big wood chopper. He's a wood, wood, big wood chopper and a, a wood really? processor. Yes. So I'd always be, like, cutting wood on some of my videos, and he's like, I love that you're always splitting wood. And I'm like, well, there's not really much else to do, So and we like to heat with wood, <laughs> so it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah. But that guy yeah. – that guy, yeah, and he's a kitchen sink guy. Yeah. He's a kitchen, and you don't want to listen. When a guy's got forty on you, 
You don't want to play kitchen sink games. You no. get, that's how you get hurt. Not at all. No, yeah. you don't want to play those games. I'm glad you're a smart guy, Win. You're a smart guy. <laughs> you're a real smart guy. Okay, so so most people don't do what you did, though. You did a very untraditional thing, and you left the Big Ten to go to the Southern Conference. Now, people will mm-hmm. do that when for a head coaching job, right? They'll do that for a head coaching job. You did it for an associate head coaching job. And yeah. a guy who you had coached, right? A guy who was, you know, yeah. a younger guy in the program at Central Michigan with he was Scotty Sentis. What went into that decision for you to leave home? You left Michigan. You're, that's where you're from. You're from, you're from here, right? You're from the thumb or here. Yep. here yep. Right? I'm from the thumb. All right. Yeah. Did I get that right? Is that right? Yeah, it's about there. About there? <laughs> about there, yeah. Okay. My mother-in-law is from like there, I think. Yeah, way up there. It's hard to do it on the video. But anyhow. People don't know what this is. This is what Michigan's shaped like. Like they call it the mitten, right? And yeah, winds from yep. the thumb. Winds from the thumb. My mother-in-law is from the thumb. So anyhow, what's it like to leave Michigan to go to North Carolina? And what went, what went into that decision for you? Um, you know, honestly, I bought into the vision and and the passion that Scotty just has right? He's, he's a very passionate coach. He's a very energetic guy. And he, he sold me a vision. He sold me a program and an athletic department and a university on the rise. And, and I bought in hook, line and sinker, whether it was the right decision or not, I bought it. And, um, I'm pretty happy, um, with my decision. Honestly, he, I took this job without going. I had no, I had never been to Bowie's Creek. And I took the job. So I didn't have a choice. My wife thought I was crazy, but she believes in me. We believe in each other. We trust each other um, when it comes to all this. And uh, she followed me down here in a pandemic, (laughs) pregnant. um, With your second child, right? She was pregnant with your second? Yeah, she was, she was pregnant with, with, with my son and, uh, she thought I was crazy and I think she was really upset with me at first, but she's, she's loving it too. You know, we, we like North Carolina. It's not Michigan in a lot of ways, but in some good ways. So we're, we're, we're really happy to be down here. Where is she from? She's from Florida. (laughs) What is with these Florida people? They don't know when they meet wrestling people, the first thing they need to do is be like, that's cool. Uh, that's cold weather. I know it's a summer games thing. It's a cold weather sport. It thrives in cold weather places. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and I know you guys are yeah. you're on the, you're on the, the North Carolina has got a, some tremendous division one and two wrestling in it. And yeah, it does a fabulous, you guys do a fabulous job. You know, 149 last year was loaded out of the state of North Carolina, but like it is incredible to see, all the people who must not do research from the South who then get with these wrestling people or or Scotty leaving Florida to go to Mount Pleasant. (laughs) What, Yeah. what, what are these people thinking? Where's she from in Florida? Uh, She's from like the Tampa area, about 40 minutes East of Tampa. Okay. And was she uh, an athlete? Where did you guys meet? We met at Illinois. So she, she went to school and played softball at university of Illinois. So college D1 college athlete, your wife was a D1 college athlete from Florida, went to Champaign, meets the assistant wrestling coach. Okay. When did you guys get, like, how long did you date and how long before you got married? Uh, We met in May, end of May, 2013. Um, And we got married January 1st, 2016. So three years, a three year courting Three years, about. About about three years, yeah. So right after you guys get married, you then move to East Lansing. What was that whole experience like for your wife? Um, I think she was excited, right? I mean, she'd been in Champaign for seven years, nine years, something like that. I don't know. She'd been there a while. <laughs> and she was – I think she was ready for something fresh. Um, so we moved up to East Lansing. And it's closer to my family, right? Um, it was a Big Ten job. She found a job pretty quickly at um, a big health club up there as a personal trainer and started 
doing her thing. You know, she's, she's a go-getter, um, hustler, people person, just an awesome, awesome person to be around. She drives me and motivates me when I get down and hopefully I can do the same for her, but she's not down a whole lot. So we moved up there and, um, you know, we just took advantage of, you know, the knowledge being at a big school, being in the big 10, learning from, you know, coach will coach Chandler and coach Williams, who've, you know, been around the block, you know, they've, they've been coaching a long time, a lot of knowledge in a lot of different areas. And, you know, I got to learn, I got to learn from them in my four years there. Um, had my daughter up there, got to spend some time around my family. So it was, she was, she was on board that move, that, that decision was an easy one. Honestly, she was, she was on board, um, to, to go and, and start moving, moving up. And I'm glad she was on board. I don't ever want to make a decision like that to move the family, um, where she's second guessing it. The one, the one to Campbell, I think is the only time that I'll make that decision. <laughs> I think it was a good one. Okay. So you guys leave the big time coach Chandler, coach Williams, two really good guys who I like, you know, Chandler's a, an Ohio guy, obviously got to mm -hmm. shout out to him. St. Ed's guy. But, you know, you leave those guys and you go down to a guy who was your – who you coached, who you coached. Yeah. He sells you on the vision there. You get there, and there was this huge – a huge upheaval, and Kerry Colat leaves, and he goes to the Naval Academy. So you passed him in the night. You passed Perez in the night. You passed, you know, uh, yeah, Heil in the night, Dean Heil in the night. These guys leave as you're coming, right? So there's a, there's a big yep. void to fill there, right? Those guys are – those guys are they're, they're a big deal in the wrestling community. They, they're draws as far as recruiting. When Mahalik's a quiet guy, a hardworking guy, an honest guy. How are you able to like start recruiting kids and hit the ground running like you did in the middle of a pandemic, as you stated? How were you able to do that? Yeah. And you guys won the you won the conference last year. You did something right. And you know, and, and, and I'm gonna get to the, the, the social media question, right? Because we talked about that at Delta. Social media was yeah. a big part of what you were doing and I don't know if Win Mahalik's the most social guy. I know he's a super nice guy, right? But, like, I don't know if you're my social media guy, but you're killing it, and you understand it, and you really get what social media is about, Win. And I, I really appreciate that about you because you could, you could like, do for the NWCA, you could teach about how important the social media is. How were you able to do that? Your wife's pregnant. You're in a pandemic. You get down there. There's this huge upheaval. This major coach leaves, and you're down there. Mm -hmm. Jim Scotty and uh, who's the third assistant? I forget. Uh, Daryl Thomas. Th um, Coach Thomas from right Illinois, now. right? He came from ODU mm -hmm. though, right? Yep. So how, how yep. do you get into that? How do you hit the ground running in order to put your guys' team in a situation to win the SOCON like you did? Well, it was, it was really, really difficult because I started in April and I lived in Michigan until August. So I had to, I had to get to know my guys and work without being down there, without being able to see any of them. Um, calling recruits. I did a lot of calls to alumni and donors to try and get them, understand them, them tell me about their program, learn a little more about as much about Campbell as I could. Um, but really it was developing the relationships with our guys. Um, and really just that getting down there in the pandemic. Once I got there in August, we had two practices. We were trying to get some type of cohesion in our team. And we didn't do it very well, honestly. We had two teams, right? How do you have cohesion in a team when you have two of them practicing separately and asking them not to all hang out as one group because of contact tracing. It, it, it wasn't great. <laughs> so that, that's, down. that's where I was. That, why, okay. Explain the, why you had to live. You got the job in April and then through August, you got to live in Michigan. Could you not leave? What was that? Why did you have to stick around so long? Um, so there was a couple things. A, there was really no reason to be down there, right? I couldn't have recruits on campus. Um, none of our guys were there, right? There, there was no one there training. They wouldn't let us train in the room. There probably, I mean, 
handful, right? Five, 10 guys, maybe we're, we're in Bowie's Creek um, just because that's where they live. Really. You know, we have guys that want to be there all the time. Um, and I had a house, right? I own, I owned a house with my wife. My wife had a really good job um, that was on hold. Honestly, their gym closed. She was on unemployment. I had a house that I had to sell. Um, and in Michigan, real estate was non-essential. So my realtor could not come to my house. They couldn't bring someone to show my house. So we didn't list my house until May sometime. And putting that on the market, I had to go down and look for a house. Um, it, it was, it was a lot of, <laughs> a lot of cogs in a wheel that none were working right. What a mess. Honestly. What a complete yeah. mess. And you got a baby and one on the way at that point. Yep. Oh my yeah. God. What a, yeah. ma- what a nightmare. What a, l- listen, logistical nightmare is the word for that. That is, that is horrible. And you're right that there's no reason for you to move down there to potentially put yourself in a situation where you have contact with a guy or someone, Hey coach, I came on campus or some, something weird happens. Why would you even go down for that? And you got this house, you got to sell. You got a pregnant wife who's on unemployment. Oh my God. What a nightmare, dude. Wow. The yeah. People talk about how make, this affected you. Wow. You make it work though, right? You figure it out. I mean, that's, I, I think that's one of the reasons wrestlers are so successful in life is we figure it out. <laughs> you know that it's got to work. So you make it work. You find a way. That's awesome. I love it. That's, that's like, that's once again, more life lesson stuff, right? Hey, you didn't get on the Olympic team, yeah. but you can come back and wrestle that Conti match. Cause that, that's a part of life, man. It's like not, you, yeah. you know, getting the next best thing, doing your best, you know, being positive through things that, that there's more to learn from that than a lot of these lessons that, that they want us to learn in a wrestling room. Right. Okay, yeah. so look, ooh, we got to put you on overtime. Are you? Are you? I know you're a goer. Can you go yeah. overtime here with me, or what? Oh, of course, of course, of course. Listen, I severely disrespected Anthony Ashnault's time, and I think next time I see him, I might he might have like a kneecap for me or something. He might beat me up because I kept him out for like two hours one night. I felt horrible. Sorry about that, Mobbin. Mobbin's a good dude, but um. When we talk about this, you guys move down there, you guys roll, you win the SOCON. You win the SOCON, and how many champs in the SOCON? Yep. Three? Three. Yeah, we had three champs. Who are your three champs? Uh, Austin Murphy at 174. Ohio. Caleb Hopkins at 180. Yep, from Ohio. Caleb Hopkins from at 184. And, Alaska. Uh, Chris Cober at one. Yeah, Chris Cobra at 197. From PA. The, the old Ohio, Alaska, PA. <laughs> right? That's that's a common yeah. one, right? That's, that's normally how teams yeah. are set up. And how many Hopkins brothers are there? We have three now. Three Hopkins. Three. three Hopkins brothers. And they're from they're from right around Anchorage. What is their Palmer? Are they Palmer? Yeah, they're Palmer. Yeah. They're Palmer. Palmer, Palmer High School. High. And then you have Josh was runner up. Josh Hyle was runner up at 49, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. We had, um, what do we have? Seven finalists, eight finalists. Eight finalists. You guys scored we a lot. Of, we had a lot of people in the finals. And you had a lot of bonus yeah. points because that's how you beat App State. App State right. lost because you guys, you guys are scoring big. You're scoring pins. You're scoring techs when they're just winning matches. And they had five champs at half the champs. Doesn't matter if you're not picking up the bonus points. Like you guys are picking up the bonus points. And you had as many guys or more guys in the finals than them, which was it? Yeah, I think we had more in the finals. Yeah, more we in the had finals, eight, and that's it. Finalists. Yeah, that's yeah. huge. That's a huge part of it. The semifinal points, the advancement points from the semis to the finals are huge. Huge. Winning, winning the tournament. There's not that much m- many more points left on the board when you after you win. It's the advancement points. Right. From the, I know that the Ohio State tournaments like that, and the NCAA tournaments like that, right? Yeah. So. Yep wild stuff man so you guys win that conference championship you're going in the ncaa tournament how many qualifiers total for campbell last year at the ncaa's we had we had seven so seven qualifiers okay yep you're going in there with some momentum you won your conference you get there and and for me 
disaster completely struck. It, as bad of a situation as it can get, you guys got that. You got dealt that hand, right? You got dealt yeah. the, the, the Josh Heil hand with uh, – what was the Oklahoma State guy's name? Was it uh, – it wasn't G. Fowler. Boo. It was Boo no, Llewellyn. It was Llewellyn. Right? Yeah. Boo Llewellyn, right? So you guys get into this crazy – overtime thing and there's bad time essentially is what happened right yeah yep and yep. there were it's bad was, time it was because that was the quarters wasn't it um no it was the uh, was it, it, it was might, no it was around a 16 it was, it was around, around a 16, 16? yep okay. i'm pretty sure it was around a 16 because josh did win another match after that okay so if it had been in quarters it would have been an all-american but yeah oh, okay so you're in that match, and it was overtime, wasn't it? Was it was it a ride out or was it the ultimate? It was it was a tie It was a tiebreaker. It was a takedown. Period. It was in a tie. It was in the tiebreaker, and we reversed him in the first tiebreaker, okay. I believe. Um, and then it was man, it, it's all blurred to me, but yeah, basically it came down. We were winning by a point with seven seconds left they went out of bounds kind of a close close uh close call that you know oklahoma state challenged right they challenged it for a takedown with as they went out of bounds well the takedown they said there's no takedown on the review right um so they come back to center and as they come back to center um the table is trying to tell the ref to wait because they have to enter in basically the results of that review and then it resets the clock ready to go. Well, as they're doing that, the ref starts the match, the match wrestles for six and a half seconds, seven seconds, somewhere, somewhere between five and seven seconds, right? Unhinged, no one's stopping them. The ref, they go out of bounds, blow the whistle, right? They wrestled all the way, blew the whistle out of bounds. The table basically says, no, <laughs> no, the clock never started. And everybody saw the clock didn't start, which is fine. And um, I was actually at the hotel with our big guys. So I'm watching this going, what's going on? Like just crazy, crazy madness, trying to get my guys ready, but also, you know, trying, you know, I'm, I'm in the match. But um, yeah, essentially what happens is they say that they can't, take the time off the clock because there's no way to tell <laughs> there's no way to count time <laughs> um, not a real-time video not not a literal real-time video no um it and, becomes guesswork uh, at that point is i believe what the exact statement was from tim shields right 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 so it it, it ends up you know we go back they wrestle the seven seconds again and josh gets taken down um we <laughs> from sitting sitting in the hotel room with Scotty until two o'clock in the morning on the phones, talking to people, talking to our AD. Um, they they essentially reviewed an appeal that doesn't exist from us. Um, and then also just decided that they couldn't change it. So uh, I think it's tragic, but you know, life goes on. You got you gotta go, you gotta move on, right? things happen to us and another life lesson, like nothing goes the way it's supposed to go. So you gotta, you gotta figure it out. Um, I know Josh did come back, win a match um, in the wrestlebacks, but I, I do think he never fully mentally recovered from that match. Um, but he's ready to go. You know, this year he's, he's a new kid. He's training really smart coming into every practice as, as a great leader for us on our team in his sixth year. And um, I think I think people are underestimating us again. So he's a super senior. How many super seniors do you have? We have two. Chris Cober is also a super senior. Okay, so your PA and Ohio guy are super seniors. Run me down real quick, starting from twenty five on up. You guys, do you guys have a massive roster? Is that what I heard? Do you have a massive roster with like fifty dudes? Um, we have forty four this year. Okay. Which is pretty That's big. Pretty I think big. I think I think Davison's bigger than us. But last year we had we had more. I think 40, 44 is better. 
44 is a little more manageable when you have one practice in a wrestling room, even though we have a big room, 44 is still a lot of guys, right? Um, that's double Northwestern's team, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. That's crazy. How nuts so, is that? That's a whole nother story, but that's insane. But you got 44 yeah. guys on the roster. Give me your best. What we could probably see to start the seasons in the November, December, and an into dual season, where who could we see out there for at 25, 33, 41, so on and so forth for the camels? You know, I think we got a lot of really deep weights. I think our deepest, one of our deepest weights is 25. You know, we got two national qualifiers. Uh, we got Corbin Mink, who's a SOCON champ. We got um, Zurich Storm, who's SOCON runner up in a national qualifier last year. And then we got three guys behind them that are nipping at their heels, honestly. So we have, uh, a really, really good problem at 25. Um, Wait, that both of those guys. 25? Are, that was literally all those names you just named were 25. <laughs> yeah, that, that's 125 pounds. Um, so, like I said, we have we have a really good problem at at 25, but it's still a problem. Both those both those guys, you know, if they're if they're our top two guys, especially, are both going to get matches, right? They're they're our guys. They're our leaders. Um, our upperclassmen. They're gonna, both going to get matches and and see who who is the best guy at the end of the day. And it sucks because I love both of them to death. One of them's, one of them's not going to be able to wrestle at the end of the season. So um, I'm, I'm excited to see it. We got wrestle offs this week, um, 133 pounds. We got another battle. We got um, Gabe Hicksonbaugh, who was our starting 33 pounder last year. And then we have um, Dominic Zaccone, who um, transferred last year from Illinois. And he's at 33 and those guys battle back and forth. You know, they're, they're going to have a great battle this weekend. So um, I think we're in good hands with which either, either one of those guys steps on the mat. And I think they're both going to get matches as well. So um, 141, we got two guys. Um, I think, I think Shannon Han is our guy, but Chris Rivera is honestly, he is nipping at his heels. He is pushing him every day. And, you know, I think Chris is, getting them sometimes, right? I think they kind of go back and forth, but I think right now Shannon's our guy. You know, he was a SOCON finalist last year, didn't qualify for the NCAA tournament, um, but I think he's bitter about that. He did train really hard, and he actually all american at juniors this summer. So, you know, he's a, he's a guy that we're looking for big things from. At 149, obviously we have Josh Heil back. You know, senior leader, um, I think we're going to be really smart with him this year, and and – have that that uh that leadership where i think he's on the podium if not on top of the podium he's just one of those guys that when he's on he's on and he can beat anybody um 157 we got a couple guys battling at, with uh, matt delara who has been to the socon tournament last year had a little bit of injury but he's come back strong had a really good summer and then um he's going to be competing against Bolal bailey this week uh, to make the team. I think those are our two guys that are going to be in the finals on Saturday for orange and black. Um, and I don't know who's going to come out on top because they're both very different wrestlers, but very capable of doing big things this season. Um, at 165 for us, it's going to be Troy nation. Um, Troy's a really hardworking kid, really strong. Um, and I think he's going to be a very good 165 pounder for us. Uh, 174, we got Austin Murphy coming back. And he is bitter about losing the round of 12. I'll tell you that he's on the mat all the time. He's training really hard, picking my ear all the time, watching film with me. So he's, he's a guy that, that really wants to be on top of the podium. Um, 184, you know, we have a really deep 184, but I think, you know, they got to knock off a guy that's ranked, you know, top 15 in the country with Caleb Hopkins. So, um, we got some other, some young guys coming up at 184, but Caleb's our guy right now. Um, you know, he had some, some big matches last year, um, big wins at the NCAA tournament, won the SOCON and he's, he's a mat rat. I have to tell that guy to take time off the mat. So I'm excited to see what he can do this year. What um, weight are the three happens is we got 184 with Caleb. What are the other two? Um, yep. Yeah, uh, Jared is a freshman at 157. Um, and he's, he is, he's a freshman. He's, he's coming in raw, ready to go, works really hard, but I don't think he's there to make the lineup yet. 
um, our other one's at 197, and he's going to battle it out with Cobra. You know, Cobra's a super senior. He's a two-time SoCon champ. And honestly, I think if, if Cobra doesn't wrestle last year, which he had a red shirt, we weren't necessarily going to wrestle Cope last year, but he stepped in in some big duels. And um, honestly, Levi Hopkins had beat the number two seed at the SoCon, right? He, he was that other guy. We had the best two guys in the SoCon at 197 last year, right? And he can only wrestle one. So I think Levi is hungry because he didn't get that chance last year, and he's going to push Chris this weekend. It's going to be an exciting match. They had some battles last year, and Cobra came out on top. But um, I'm excited to have a full season with some opens where they both can get some some good experience and see who comes out on top at 197. And then at heavyweight, I have five heavyweights. You tell me one other room. Five heavyweights. I have five heavyweights. Five. And uh, I think we have two that that are on top, but we got we got some big big boys that, that wrestle really hard. I got hand fighting really hard. And, um, we got, I think our, our two top runners, um, unless they get upset or, or hurt, God forbid they get hurt, knock on wood, um, are, are Chad Nix and uh, Tay Gadiali. So Tay was, a, Tay was a SoCon runner up last year. He's good. Chad got a little banged up last year, which is why we brought Tay up from 197 to wrestle. So, and then Tay's just gotten big this summer. <laughs> So you had a 97 who went up to, to heavy. Yeah. I yeah. like that. I really like that move. Those dudes who are monsters at 97 and maybe they're struggling with the weight and then you can put them up to heavyweight. They're smaller. They're more mobile than regular guys. But I mean, it, it's crazy to see. I like that transition. I'm a big fan of it. I, I like to see it as much as possible. And I'm telling a lot of high school kids when I talk to them, I'm like, get as big as you can. Get as big as you can yeah. because you're not running into win Mahalik's. There's not Roger Kishes at all the weights. There's not J.D. Bergman's at all the weights. Because you guys are all – I know that between you and J.D., J.D.'s a multi-sport. He was a football player. You're a football player. You guys are at yeah. uh Last yeah. year, my nephew won the state in uh, Ohio at 195, and I think six of the eight guys were all state in football at the on the podium, right? And I'm like – Oh, I believe it. I believe it. Right? It's a football weight. You yeah. get athletes, but – if you go up and you're a superior athlete like you or how a J.D. Bergman is really good athlete, you're going to beat most of those guys, right? And then if you can get up to heavyweight and get big, you know, as, as long as you're not wrestling Golden Bears, Coach, you know, Thompson, you know, all the time, you right. beat a lot of those right. guys too, you know? So it's like, you know, man, you've been wrestling big guys forever. And it, it, it's crazy to see when a 97 goes up to heavyweight and gets – and they're successful. I like it. Uh, cowboy bulk job, they call them in Oklahoma State. Yeah, right. Derek White, cowboy bulk job, right? But yeah. um, you and I had a conversation at Delta. Um, and obviously, you guys are trying to win a SOCON title again. And you've done a great job of telling the country about that, right? And we had this conversation where we talked about social media. And that's, that's everything I do is based off of my social media. And that's how people can see it. You know, I worked with Flow Wrestling for a decade, over a decade. And now I don't work with them anymore. But a lot of my social media has carried over and I still have loyal social media followers from when I worked for them. Right. And you and I talked about it, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that they don't focus on your guys' program. I'm lucky that they don't care about the SOCON. I'm lucky that they don't care about the Mac because those are my, that's my wheelhouse. Those are the schools that I like the yeah. Mac guy, but talk about the importance of social media. Talk about how when Mahalik, a guy, a quiet guy, is able to lead one of the most successful social media campaigns in college wrestling with Campbell. Oh man, I can't, I can't do it, but we hire, we hire great social media guys that um, can do it. And then they get yeah, the best part out of it. us. <laughs> you're a part of it. You and I were talking about you talking to a camera, about yeah. talking to yourself. Oh gosh. That's, that's awful. At least right now I'm talking to you. That's um, true. But that's yeah, true. talking talking, talking into a camera with no one around me after I go for a run in the morning, just, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, people probably think I'm crazy, but I'm talking into a camera and then, you know, our social media guy kind of cuts it up so that it looks pretty, but you know, it's getting a message out there. It's getting, you know, our Creek mentality, right. Our Creek mindset, our relentless pursuit, you know, what we believe in and what our program is out to the masses. And, you know, Every program can do it, but 
to what level are you doing it? How, how important is it for you to get your program's message out there? You know, your program's um, mantra, if you have one, right? And for us, that's what our social media does. It tells the world who we are if you don't want to watch a Campbell duel, if you don't want to read our newsletters, right? How many people, how many teams do newsletters still? Do you, do you, how many people get them read, right? But a two minute video, everybody will watch, especially if it's cool, right? You get to know the guys. It tells our guys stories, right? It, it's social media is so big and it's not big because we want it to be big. It's big because the masses want it to be big. And it, it really is such an important part of, I think, Olympic sports, um, making Olympic sports relevant to people that aren't wrestling fans, right? Um, you know, just Campbell fans. We have, you know, Campbell fans who aren't wrestling people that, follow us and and want us to do well and you know help our program out in so many ways just because our social media is fun to follow it's always changing and it it really um, gives people a handle on who we are as a program and that's why it's important you got to have it you have to have it otherwise you're just a faceless program the big tens obviously had a huge advantage the big 12 yeah. traditional core teams they have a huge uh advantage as well right because the big 10 network's huge oh, oh who is this 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 is my daughter brenly she came to say good night can you say hi brenly can you say hi she's a little shy can you say good night say good night good night brenly no you're too shy can i have a kiss Good mom and go to bed, okay? I love you. How old is Brenly? Brenly's three. Brenly's three. When's she four? Oh, August. August. Okay. So I have a, my son Thomas is turning four. He's three right now. He turns four next week. He's a real piece of work. A real piece of work. <laughs> not not like that. Like that's a nice, kind, shy child. My kid's the opposite. But I, I'm glad we got a surprise. I like a surprise drop in like that. That's good for me, Win. I like that. Yeah, I have to go up and snuggle or something after those with my kids. But uh, you know, the huge advantage that the big what Big Ten schools have with the Big Ten Network, Big Twelve, similar type yeah. uh, media. You know, they have a whole staff of media, right? You're doing it with one or two people, and one of them's the yeah. coach too, right? I mean, they're yeah. doing. They have a whole staff of people. They have a whole. They have a network, right? I mean, yeah. Think about that. How much of those guys, all of them. Everybody in the Big Ten can grab those dual meet highlights and throw it up on Twitter. It's up there in under five minutes, man. It's crazy. Yeah, it's fast. It's, it's fast. So quick. And here, this was awesome. Ten years ago when I started doing that, you know, 2008 when I started doing this, I think I videoed your first, your last MAC tournament in 2009 for Flow Wrestling. Yeah. I, remember I did. Yeah, I did. So I remember, you know, I videoed that first MAC tournament in 2008. You know, the MAC schools – Josh Moore was a coach at Kent State, and he was like, hey, man, we don't like you filming our stuff. We don't want people to see our guys. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, we don't like our stuff out there. <laughs> it was it, – it, <laughs> right? I was like – Yeah. 2008, he's a young coach. I get it. But I'm like – and I remember even my mentality then was, I was like, you think guys go to the Big Ten? And they had the Big Ten Network then. Yeah. I said, do you think guys go to the Big Ten to not be on the Big Ten network? You know, and he, and yeah. I, and Josh had that mentality for a long time. Josh Moore really felt like it was a disadvantage to see our guys. And now there's video on everybody, and it's obviously changed. But he hung on to that for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. And it was kind of it was crazy to me. And I was like, dude, the times are changing. This is a different deal, man. You don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And it and changed that, really fast. Oh, really, really fast. Really fast. I think, I think at, at one point around that time, you know, when flow first came out, big 10 network was starting to get big. It was an advantage to be a small school and not, not like going to the national tournament to be a small school and not having those big schools have film on your guys. Right. It, there was an advantage to it of going and, 
you know, the Big Ten, they all knew each other. Everybody knew the Big Ten, right? No matter what conference you were in, everybody knew the Big Ten. But you didn't have film on those Mac schools or, you know, the, the EWL schools, right? Those, those small schools where there wasn't film and there wasn't a whole lot of schools, it was really tight knit. And so they, I really feel like there was some wins because they didn't know what they were getting hit with, right? They'd come out there with a trick and, and get hit with it and maybe pinned or maybe hit with it three or four times and um, not be able to wrestle back and get those points back. But now it's gone, right? That, gone. that advantage totally gone. is gone. You're you're Gone. listen. That was Josh That was Josh Moore's mentality too, and he was he wasn't wrong. He was just he was yes. fighting a battle of futility. It was like, yes. hey, stop the clock! You can't stop the clock, right? We're, we've got progress. Exactly. It was like, and I think like a Mike Miller, a Mike Miller really thrived from that because I don't think I think he was always like they didn't know who he was. He was sneaky. Nope. He had a high pace. He wrestled hard. And I don't think yeah. this, I think that they, they, they took that guy for granted. They didn't know who that guy was. I think that really helped him. Yeah. I think you were on the yes. radar though. You're a freshman all American. They know you, they've seen you, they knew what you had. Right. But like, a they, Mike Miller they guy. knew I was, I was not, uh, <laughs> I was not under the radar after, um, tournament of champions, the Reno tournament of champions, my sophomore year. And I, beat Phil Davis in the semis I don't know by a few points like I it it was one of the more better matches I wrestled against Phil I'll say that right um and then in the finals I kind of rolled through and and caught Rosholt on his back and ended up beating Jared Rosholt so I beat Phil Davis and Rosholt in the same tournament and was the number one seed for the rest of the season um, and those two wrestled in the finals at the NCAA tournament. But so since crazy. after that, I was, after that, I was never, never under the radar. That's for sure. They had to scout it at that point. They had, they knew what you did. Yeah. And they were, they were, they would share film on you guys. Yes. That was the other but, crazy thing about it. Yeah. That was, that was the other thing is like, I wrestled, I lost to uh, Chris Weidman from Hofstra that year in the second round. And I didn't know who he was. Right. They only seated top 12. Right. So he got drawn in. I wrestled in the round of 16 and he hit me in like three slide buys. Nasty, nasty slide buys. <laughs> so like there was still that advantage then. And, but like I said, I was the number one seed that there was no one, like you said, they're trading film. <laughs> they're trading yeah. their film to everybody. Was that the year Weidman took third? No, no, that was, uh, he did not end up placing, I don't believe. Maybe it was – man, maybe he did. I, th I don't think he took third that year. Maybe he did. I don't know. The year you did not All-American, what year was that? My junior year. Junior year? My junior year. So you were the yeah. one seed as a sophomore. Yeah. And yeah. What place did I was, you take? My junior year. Uh – Eighth. Took eighth as a sophomore. Eighth. Yep. And then as yep. a junior, what seed were you going as a junior? Eleven, maybe. Not good. Not good. What was the difference? What happened your junior year? Did you have an injury? No, it was uh, complacency. <laughs> Just not – not being in the training like I had been, um, just just not not training right. Honestly, like thinking stuff was going to get handed to me. Um, I think Max Askren majored me during the season in the duel. Um, I I just it was not a good season. I went in and I had Nick Roy from Michigan, who I'd beat pretty handily in the duel that year. And he took me into like double overtime and beat me. It, it was it was complacency and not wrestling every match as an important match. So you don't place as a junior. You're a two time All American at that point. You'd won the conference every year. Going into yep. your senior year, how did Tom Borelli get you guys? How did Casey Cunningham, whoever it was, who was the person 
that sets you right and puts you into a situation to be an All-American national champ. You know, you're a runner-up as a senior. Who fixed that? Who righted that? Because a lot of guys throw All-American two times. Sometimes they don't get back there then, right? Like, could it happen to you? How did you get right from your junior to your senior year? Um, I think it was both of them. Honestly, Casey, Casey worked with me. Um, he was trying to make an Olympic team that year, so he was in and out. But when he was in, he worked on uh, – hold on. Sorry, my wife just um, – he, he, really, he really focused on my training as, like, being sound, right? I'd always been, like, not a loose cannon, but a throw the sink at you, right? And he got me to still have that stuff, but also get a little bit more sound, right? Real basic with my defense and um, not, not going for the cradle if a guy stood up, like jumping to it. And just, just getting very sound, solid on top, being stingy on top, stingy with my defense. Um, and Tom mentally just got me right. Like a loss, it's okay. It's a learning process right? Um, really just pushing me through the season on taking it one match at a time and focusing on, um, you know, what was at hand? What was that next match? Who was I going up against? What were the good matchups, you know, and um, got to the national tournament and I really felt like I had a great draw. You know, I was a four seed and people think that's crazy because I had uh, defending national champ Josh Glenn in the semis, but I felt like I matched up better against Glenn than I did against Davis or Dallas Hurts, who was on the other side. Um, and so I just took it one match at a time. You know, I had uh, Askren in the quarters, and I felt like that was a good match because he threw the kitchen sink at you, right? But if I stayed basic and I did my things, I kept my pace – it was, it was what I had been training for all season. And then things fell together, right? Things fell together, and I had some really good matches when I needed them and got in the finals. Do you think Tom Borelli does the most with the least out of any college coach in D1? Man, I can't think of anybody at the top of my head that does, does is better than him, right? He, he brings in guys and gets them to buy into his system that work hard. You know, they're always going to be in shape. They're going to be ready to go at the end of the year. They're just tough. They're really tough. <laughs> you got to follow the game plan, too. Um, he's really good at letting a guy like you do the intangible things that you do, do when Mahala kitchen sink things. But he's also really good at, at his system. You know, yeah. a good ride on top, attack both sides of the body, win a hand fight, score at the end of the period like they used to do. And and control the center of the mat, and they do, it's just a real basic stuff. You got to get off the mat too, right? That's like yeah, just super basic things I just said. And he's like, well, yeah, yep. that's the that's the that's the blueprint for anyone to win. Like, who can't win with that blueprint? Now, because I talked to him at Cleveland State last year, they wrestled Cleveland State in a duel, and, and he's like, yeah, yeah, that's that's what we do. It's it's a real basic style. But I, when people stray from the path of what he's telling you to do, I don't think it goes well for them. No. No, it's, he, he has a system, he has a system and, you know, when you, you have special talents, right. And he takes your talents, puts them in his system and, and makes some really great wrestlers. He's, he's done it his entire career. You know, he just got inducted into the Lake state, state superior state athletic hall of fame. Right. And he was there before central Michigan, but for them to recognize him, is is awesome. I'm really proud of Coach Brawley for that. But he he does. He's he's one of the best coaches, one of the best coaches ever. Honestly, he he just he's at Central Michigan because he loves Central Michigan. He loves the Chippewas and he loves the program that he's built. And um, you know, I'm I'm proud to come through there. Um, I'm I don't there aren't many people that have graduated with Coach Brawley that are not proud of of being a Chippewa and being part of part of his programs. So. Now you got to line up against him with him and beat him too. Still, <laughs> yeah, right. You know right? what's coming, though. You know what's coming. Your guys, your guy knows what's coming. You know what's coming, right? Yep. 
Yeah, Scotty and I both know it. <laughs> yeah, you guys both know it's coming. So, all right, Coach, we are out of overtime. Is there anything right. else that you've got for me? I know that I know that the the bedtime routine's heating up. You got you got your wife <laughs> getting at you. You got anything else for me? Is there anything we missed? Anything that you got for me about the camels? About anything I missed? I listen. I need. I need to know the number of touchdowns your senior year. I got it. It's the only thing. Oh, I, man. You got it. Listen, call my dad, whoever it is, whoever, uh, uncle, whoever was a big fan of yours. Cause, so you had 1,400 yards rushing, 2,200 yards passing. Gets lost in the state semifinal. But we got to yeah. get that number. It has to be over 40 touchdowns. It's over. I'll, it's I'll, I'll see. I'll see who I can, uh, who I can find. But my <laughs> parents are actually football here because they're here for orange and black this week. Yeah, oh. listen, listen. No, you're the no. best football player I've ever no. talked. You and JD Bergman are the two best wrestlers that I've talked to who are football players. Do you realize that? Oh man, no. Thank I you. I mean, though. I appreciate that. No, I'm just gonna say this: you're both better football players than Jermail Porter, and he played two years in the NFL. Well, but he had something you can't do. You, six eight. <laughs> man, you gotta talk to you. You got to talk to Stephen Neal because that dude was a beast oh, okay. too. Okay, okay, okay. I think on. he was all pro. I've interviewed him, but I'm saying on the show, I've had you, I've had J.D. Oh, Bergman, okay. and I've had, right. I've had, uh, I've had uh, uh, Jermail on. I've had all three of you guys on, and you're the top football player. I'm letting J- oh, J.D. I Bergman only had 1,400 yards rushing. Oh I man! Like the, well, I mean, that's really good. No, I know it's really good, but you had 22 yard, 100 yards passing on top of it. It's incredible. So, all right, stick around real quick. Uh, Win Mahalik, Barbarian Hour. Check out Barbarian Apparel at www.barbarianapparel.com. Win, stick around real quick. Hello, wrestlers and coaches. I'm Teague Moore. I spent 20 years coaching at the Division I level in the NCAA, 15 of those years as a head coach. During that time, I helped a lot of wrestlers and parents navigate the recruiting process. I've now opened my own consulting business to do just that to help you navigate the recruiting process. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do scholarships work? What program would be right for my son? Or better yet, what coach would be right for my wrestler? I can help answer these and many other questions. Feel free to email me or call me at the information listed below and we can set up your first consultation today. I look forward to working with you and helping you make the right choice.